So, um, this is me. My name is Natalie. I live in Edmonton, Alberta, very, very far north in Canada. Um, and those are the two websites for the projects that I've been working on. The first one, Maternal Ecologies, is my um, artistic practice, and Do Maternalisms is my curatorial practice, and I also um, work as an art historian. So this is a little bit, um, mostly I'm going to focus on my work as an artist um, and bring in some of my work as a curator and a theorist and art writer a little bit at the very end. Um, and so I'm going to start with um, the... Uh, a, a genesis that is um, identical for many of, um, of us uh, from my generation. So um, Mary Kelly, I owe in many ways my uh, current intersection of practices to Mary Kelly, who I first encountered in text as an art theorist, not as an artist, um, back in the summer of 1997. After this first encounter, which was with reviewing modernist criticism, I went on to discover Mary Kelly not only as a provocative theorist, but also as an artist of the infamous postpartum document. Motherhood being really far away from my mind at that point, it was her engagement with Lacan that drew me in. And it led me to picking up this little text you may have heard of called The Mirror Stage and devouring it in one sitting. So in some ways, through each of these encounters, Mary Kelly birthed me phantasmatically as an hybrid artist, academic, someone who is authorized to cross practice theory lines and work seriously and responsively between them, both as an artist and as an academic, which is also something that there were very few models for when I was in art school. Little did I know at that time that the vector between artist and academic would critically expand to include mother. So over 10 years later, I found myself finishing my dissertation on the job market and pregnant. Kelly's work, as well as that of other key feminist artists from the 70s and the 80s, inspired what became a three-year arts-based research project performed with my son from his third month to his third birthday. In what follows, I'm going to offer a really short description of each of the three years of that project a project I have since called Maternal Ecologies. So this is part one, the first part, an action a day, maternal prescriptions. For this, I invited five mothers from three countries and four cities, also academics and or artists with children under the age of two, to perform with me every day for three months. To begin the project, I sent this brief description to my collaborators. This project is about the ecologies of care, the texture, everyday, maternal life project. I send you a performance action from my experience of daily life. For example, listen to baby's breath, watch baby sucking on finger, observe the rise and fall of breath, or whatever action I want to bring the attention of performance to for that day. You do the same for me. I perform as many actions as are sent to me, and if none are sent, I only perform my child's action. Each day's action will be documented both in video and still form with my smartphone and uploaded to the web. Duration 12 weeks, August 1st to October 23rd, 2010. So every day for 84 days in a row, I picked one element of my every day and labeled it performance. I wrote a performance score for it and then sent that score or instruction piece to my collaborators to witness and or perform for themselves with their differently aged children. So my um, two-month premature, uh, three-month-old, so one-month corrected child, um, performing actions that I was developing with him with their you know, one-year-old newly walking toddler. Right? So my collaborators were then invited to uh, send me scores from their daily lives. And here we have... So here's um, one of the scores you may... Um, have done this one yourself without knowing that it was a performance score. Develop co coping mechanisms. Discover how flushing the toilet can stop the scream. So this is the um, <laughs> this is the portion with sound. <laughs> so I don't know if we can get this to not. It's because of the mic. It's too close. Oh well. Well, let's see. Let's just a little bit of sound, and we won't make this go for too long. Um, so um, we're, for all the mothers in here, it'll be really easy to drown out the sound that isn't relevant and just listen to the, the sound that is relevant, which in this case is the crying. So while I proposed a maternal prescription every day, my collaborators were free to pick and choose when they would participate. 
This meant that on some days, my son and I performed alone together, while on other days, my son and I had three or four actions to perform. This practice inserted into my every day a commitment to and a relation with an international community of feminist mothers facilitated by internet technology. The instructions that framed the performance actions were at once coping mechanisms and an invitation to perform with me in a way that would or could recalibrate our diffractive experiences and affects. In contrast to my modes of attention in this first year, in my second year of mothering, I found myself entangled. Um, in my second year of mothering, I found myself entangled, not in that kind of immersive intensity, but instead in a narrative of firsts. My son's first steps, his first words, his first view of the New York City skyline, the first time he said, uh-oh, and pointed to something that he dropped, his shoe fell off, and I hadn't seen it, so he pointed to it, and I, I got to find it and bring it back. So my seduction with these firsts, and my super-egoic criticism of that seduction battled. In response to this conflict, on one of his first big firsts, his first birthday, I began the second chapter of Maternal Ecologies, an action a day documenting firsts, which involved identifying a first every day for 210 days, the amount of time he was in utero since he was born at 32 weeks, and taking a still photograph of that first, posting it to a dedicated blog and reflecting in text on the world of reference or meaning or affect that this first was drawing me into. In documenting these firsts, I found myself confronted with a rich legacy of feminist concern, challenging gendered naturalizations of maternal sentiment. Rather than naturalizing sentimentality, I saw this project as an exercise in both questioning and cherishing the bioaffective entanglement of maternal care work denaturalizing maternal sentiment in one way, but also bathing in its endogenous drugs, its transferential webs. The transferential webs of maternal affect and labor color my writing life, my teaching life, and even my practice of being a colleague. Banal as this may sound to all of us in the room, as a mother with a still fairly young child, trying to work responsively between the academic and the artistic and the maternal, my capacity to dwell in any one thing has been completely recalibrated into a multimodal dance that takes surrender and creativity and patience. This recalibration is one that has shifted every year. And accordingly, each segment of the three-year project reflects something specific about my needs during that period. So while maternal prescriptions concerned itself with the overwhelming intensity of infancy, Documenting firsts, grounded in the move from infant to toddler, the move out of my arms, was grounded in the movement from infant to toddler, out of my arms and into the world. And then on May 9, 2013, I completed the first and last, the third and last part of Maternal Ecologies. For part three, action a day, gone, there, or fort da, my son and I documented my departures and arrivals over the last trimester of his second year, and the project ended on May 9, 2013, when my son turned three. Whereas the first two daily practice years were performed in the context of a body that was still variably tied like an appendage to mine, in this third year, we could no longer relate to each other in this way. Try as I might in moments of nostalgia. Um, so responsive to this new structure of relating, for the final year, I handed him the smartphone. Um, with the invitation to document in video our departures and our reunions. Generally, this meant that the video was taken at odd angles with extreme close-ups. <laughs> Over the course of three months, I watched him develop a relationship with my smartphone, using it as a transitional object. This was also my first year as a full-time tenure-track professor. So um, the departures and returns were kind of marked with a temporal kind of beat that was different from the first two years. So I'd offer him the device every day as I left, and I'd say my goodbyes while he held it, pointing the camera lens in whatever direction he pleased. And then, similarly, when I returned every day, I took out my smartphone, I pressed record on the video, and handed it to him, asking him about his day. 
His, uh, the audio track captured our negotiations and ritualizing of departures and reunions. Some days I would hand him the phone with no incident. Others he would refuse, knowing what was to come. Towards the end of the project, he would grab the phone from me when he saw it was time, do the ritual almost without me, and then turn back to whatever he was engaged in. Each of the three parts of maternal ecology is structured differently my attention, right, within an aesthetic and a performative and a political frame. To use the philosopher of science Isabel Stenger's language, each vectorized my concrete experience. Through the three years of the project, I worked to inhabit the thick daily practice of mothering from perspective that was resistant to idealized representation and open to affective entanglement and intensity. One of the primary aims for me was to perform from the presupposition of a complex, material, semiotic ecology of practices at the heart of feminist mothering. A conception of mothering as an affective, social, cultural, and material thinking practice at odds with conceptions of motherhood that see it as a training relation organized around the social good. Instead, I'm interested in exploring the material tropic pleasures of the maternal without closing down the multivalence of what these could mean, particularly to those of us navigating the complex intersections of creative professional and maternal practice. To return to Stingers, an idea always exists as engaged in a matter, that is, as mattering. As a result, a problem is always a practical problem. It's never a universal problem mattering for everybody. Problems of the ecology of practices are also practical problems in this strong sense. That is, they are problems for practitioners. This, uh, the maternal, has been, for the last five years, just such a problem for me. Engaged in matter and presenting itself as a knot of generative questions that have structured my artistic, academic, and curatorial life. In these latter, my academic and curatorial practices, I found myself re-examining the context of 1970s feminist assertions, such as the following one by Mary Kelly, um, with which I'm sure we're all familiar. Um, it seemed crucial, not in the sense of a moral and imperative, but as a historic strategy to avoid the literal figuration of the mother and child, to avoid any means of representation which risked recuperation as a slice of life. To use the body of the woman, her image or person is not impossible but problematic for feminism. And as those of us who were at the conference in London remember, Griselda Pollock did a wonderful job at the very end pointing out that when um, in the history group in London they were doing their work, they were like in their 20s. And she was like, you know, who hasn't in grad school? She was like, I was still in grad school. Who hasn't said stuff that was very strong and maybe a little stronger than they meant and then kind of had to rework it? Um, and I take that point seriously. And yet... Statements like this founded and generated whole waves of conversation in contemporary feminist art that have effects, as we've already started to hear and will continue to hear, for those of us navigating those complex intersections of early motherhood and creative practical, uh, creative um, life. So this was really generative for me, this. To use the body as a woman is not impossible but problematic for feminism. With historically powerful statements like this in mind, I've been looking to contemporary work using the performing body as a basis from which to explore the maternal as a daily condition and as a set of practices and as a mode of ethics attentive to relation and vulnerability and care. I've been doing this um, with, through a set of curatorial programs grounded in a feminist new materialist perspective called new maternalisms. While distance from the body was an important political stance for a particular moment in feminist art, one that has been worked with and challenged more than once in the decades since, it seemed to me that the enmeshed, material, performing body was something that still needed reassessment in thinking through contemporary art and the maternal. According to most, under, uh, to most understandings, new, mat new mater materialism, which is um, in its feminist incarnation, a term that's attributed to someone you probably know out here, Rosie Bradotti, is organized around a central presupposition that we can think of as post-humanist, that um, our world is not in the first instance divided into subjects and objects, but instead 
made up of various materialities constantly engaged in a network of relations. One wonders if Rosie wasn't, and no, she wasn't, um, a mother when she came up with, uh, when she began this. And this is, of course, a quote from Jane Bennett, um, Forces That Matter. So this kind of um, various materialities constantly engaged in a network of relations is important not only for the kind of thing power that Jane Bennett is talking about, but also the things that are not normally thought of as material. For example, language, sign, and idea. And through this, new materialism challenges the constructed binary in which we autonomously inhabit our bodies and from this location act upon an external and often passive world. In short, new materialism proposes that the relationship between bodies and spaces and psyches and meanings are never a priori determinable. We find ourselves instead in the realm of what Donna Haraway calls the material semiotic, a non-reductive enmeshment of modes that we've been trained to think of as separate, practice and theory, mind and body, etc. The new maternalisms that interest me attend to these enmeshments in ways that produce us not as in but of the world and call us into modes of accountability and responsibility that are uniquely suited to what Andrea Liss, for example, calls thinking motherwise or, from a different perspective, it attends to what artist and theorist Braca Ettinger calls the matrixial or, as we are hearing here, what Bagason calls modernisms. Models like these encourage me to ask what we might gain by taking seriously the remaking of selves and practices demanded by the maternal. Alongside social activism that works towards wage labor for mothers, adequate daycare, shared parenting, and parental leave, we can also look to contemporary maternal work in the arts to, dem- to remind us that it's not only the balancing of work and motherhood that are at stake, but also the remaking of how we do and we think these categories. While we may continue to value the capacity to be self-sufficient and autonomous and independent, both in our construction of human sociality and in our artistic and other cultural practices, what I've been calling new maternalisms by taking the social as a mater- and the maternal as a materialist category challenges us, I think, to find another way forward. And that's what I've been working on. Thank you. Thank you.